This afternoon at 4 o'clock we're going to be studying the book of Philemon in the New Testament, a little one chapter book and uh, this being the Lord's Day I think it would be a good idea for us to all come back and study that. So I invite you to come back and be with us in that, uh, in that study and uh, I think it will be beneficial to each and every one of us. I want to thank David for the reading of the scripture. We're going to use the book of Proverbs this, uh, this morning in, in our study, and so uh, we'll get underway with that because Proverbs is an interesting book. The book of Proverbs is uh, something that I often refer to as just timeless wisdom for our time. Uh, and indeed that is the, the, the case. The, the design and the structure of the book of Proverbs makes it an absolutely unique and fascinating book. And, and, and I say that because when you look at the book of Proverbs, you're going to see in, in, you know, there's no long standard, you know, theme that necessarily runs throughout the book of Proverbs except in the first eight or nine chapters. Uh, and that is dealing with the subject of wisdom. But what you will see in the book of Proverbs is just little short pithy, that means to the point sayings uh, that absolutely give us some timeless wisdom. For example, in the, in the 14th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we see in verse 1, it says, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish woman pulls it down with her hands. That's just a short to the point saying that is absolutely chock full of, of wisdom. Now, when you think about Proverbs, uh, usually when we th think about Proverbs, we, we think about the Old Testament book of Proverbs. And that's probably the way that we should look at it. But in reality, we have our Proverbs today. Uh, we have little short sayings that have some profound uh, meaning to them. As a matter of fact, we hear that you know people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. The picture is worth a thousand words. All of these are just modern day uninspired proverbs. There's no such thing as a free lunch. The early bird catches the worm. Birds of a feather flock together and a fool and his money are soon parted. These are just modern proverbs. And this is what you see in the Old Testament book of Proverbs by inspiration of obviously, but nevertheless they're just short little sayings that have a great deal of meaning for us in, in, in life. Proverbs uh, it, it is interesting from the standpoint that it, it gives us just such a valuable wealth of information. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I just kind of deviate just a little bit I think the book of Proverbs is probably my wife Sue's favorite book in all the Bible because anytime we're facing an issue, she said, well, you know the proverb writer says, and she's pointing me directly to the book of Proverbs, and that's usually the case. The proverb writer has, has indicated something that would be very applicable to whatever it is that we're facing in, in life. Proverbs, and we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second, Proverbs was written mainly by... King Solomon. Now, what's interesting about King Solomon was when he became king, uh, God gave him a, you know, basically, what is your wish? I'll grant you whatever you want. And so what he did in, in 1 Kings chapter 3 is he asked God for wisdom how to lead and, and, and rule God's people. So God granted him wisdom. And the wisdom of Solomon is something that was known throughout the world. And people would come from all over the world just to listen to what Solomon had to say. Now, when he penned these proverbs, he did that, of course, by inspiration. And when we think about the purpose of these proverbs, we have to go back, uh, we have to go back and, and look at the wisdom that Solomon had. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now, like I say, he's the author of these, all but two chapters in the book of Proverbs. Solomon did not author chapters 30 and 31. Uh, king Lemuel offered, uh, wrote those prophecies, or wrote those uh, Proverbs. 
In 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 32, Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. So you kind of see here the wisdom that God had given to him and he was able to, uh, to put the pen to for future generations. Proverbs 25 and verse 1. These also are Proverbs of Solomon which the men of Hezekiah king of Judah copy. So here we get an idea of the wisdom of, uh, 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 of Solomon. Now these Proverbs i got to tell you they, they transcend <coughs> biblical dispensations. And, and, and that's important for us to think about. Because we recognize that we're living in the gospel dispensation. We're living under the New Testament. We understand that. We respect that. There's no question about that. And we have to look to the New Testament for our authority, for the way that we do things. But what I want you to understand is the book of Proverbs has so much information in it that transcends these dispensations. They would have been applicable then. They are applicable now. The wisdom that we can get from them then is the same wisdom that can be gotten from them now. So they are just as profound and applicable today as when they were written for the ancient Semitic society in which Solomon lived. They were written by Solomon and we can benefit from them, but we've got to understand the purpose of them. The purpose of the book of Proverbs was expressed in the reading uh, that we had just a few moments ago. And I'll not necessarily read all of these verses again, but I want you to look at what the pro Proverbs are intended to do. Give us wisdom. Give us perception. Give us the prudence to be able to make good judgments. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. That's why it transcends time. And it is it, it's just something that is filled with information that helps us. That helps us to be able to cope with life and the problems of life. And that we're able to receive and give wise instruction. So the book of Proverbs is very valuable to us even today. And so this gives us an idea of what they are. They are a manual for life. They're a guide that we can look to that gives us domestic and social and economic and civil tranquility. And so if we were just look into the book of Proverbs, not, not for our authority how to worship, not for our authority to how to become Christians, but just look into the book of Proverbs as that wisdom that came from the pen and the mind of King Solomon that's going to help us in every kind of way. Now, when you think about Proverbs, I want you to, uh, I want you to consider something. I want you to consider the meaning of proverb. What a proverb is. Now, we kind of touched upon that just a little bit a moment ago. But the word proverb comes from the Hebrew word bashal, meaning to be like. That's what Proverbs... And it's very closely related to the New Testament word parable. And not, not, not exactly, but very, very close in comparison. And when you look at the Proverbs, you're going to see a, a you know, this is like this. This is like that. That's what, a, that's what a proverb is. It, it, it's to be like or represents. I'll give you a couple of illustrations here. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Whoever, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like. Is like a city broken down without walls. Chapter 25 and verse 28. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like. Is like what? Well, it's like one who takes a dog by the ear. So you're asking for trouble. And so this is how we need to look at the Proverbs. They are that which gives us this great amount of inspiration. But somebody said, J.R., J.R., I, you know, I, I don't do that. I, I'm just not one that gets into the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's about all I can do to read and study the New Testament. I, and so, I, you know, I just don't get a lot out of the book of Proverbs. But you know what? I've got to tell you something. The writers of the New Testament got a lot out of the book of Proverbs. 
because they're quoted several times in the New Testament. And so they recognize the value of these Old Testament Proverbs. For example, My son, do not uh, despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. That's a great, great thought. So great, the Hebrew writer employed that in his information in Hebrews 12 and verse 5. Reaching back, bringing that which transcends dispensations, and bringing it from that era into our era. And you could also look, surely he scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble. That was so important, that was such an important proverb that both James and Peter quotes from that proverb to make a New Testament application. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Peter pointed that out in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. And then again, Proverbs 25 and verse 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Paul mentions that proverb in chapter 12 and verse 20 of the book of Romans. So you see, this is what I want us to see and understand. That the things that were written in Proverbs are so valuable, filled with so much information about tranquility and how to cope with life, that we need to be looking at that and we need to bring these into our lives as well. I want to clear up something here. You know, when you look in the book of Proverbs, you're going to see that very often it talks about a fool. It talks about a foolish man. And so sometimes we look at that and we think, well, he didn't say that it's a sin. He said that this is foolish. And so if it's foolish, it's not a sin. that's, That's a mistake on our part. And and, and the reason that I say that is because we fail to comprehend how God uses various offices in the Old Testament to depict the same thing in different words. Let me show you what I mean by that. In Jeremiah 18 verse 18, Then they said, Come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish. i got three terms underlined here and I want to call your attention to those. He said, the law will not perish from the priest. Priest, number one. Nor counsel from the wise. Number two. Nor the word from the prophet. Number three. So when you look in God's book, you look in the Old Testament, God dispensed His will through priests, prophets, and wise men. Let me show you what what that does. What that does is, to the prophet... When he would talk about sin, he would say it's disobedience and rebellion against God. That's how the priest would deal with sin. You're rebelling against God and you are disobedient to God. But it's sin. Now the priest, the priest who occupied the temple, who offered the worship and other aspects of dispensing the law of Moses in that regard, to the priest... Sin was viewed as uncleanness and defilement. He didn't refer to it as rebellion and disobedience. If you engage in sin, you're defiling and you are unclean. But it's still sin. Dealing with the same thing from different perspectives. Now, that takes us to the book of Proverbs. That takes us to the wise man. The wise man did not view sin as disobedience and rebellion. It was. The prophet made made that clear. And he didn't view sin as uncleanness and impurity. The priest did that. The wise man dealt with sin and he said, you know what? It's foolishness and it's folly. But it's still sin. So when you, read in the New Te- when you read in the book of Proverbs that something is foolish, a, a young man devoid of understanding is folly, you know, keep in mind he's talking about sin here. He's just using different terminology to describe sin. Sin to the prophet, rebellion. Sin to the priest, uncleanness. Sin to the wise man, foolishness and folly. Now, let's get into the theme of the book of Proverbs and then we're going to get into the meat of our study. 
Proverbs tw- verse one, or chapter 1, verses 2 and 7 give us the idea of the theme, what Proverbs is seeking to accomplish. To know wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I want to tell you something, my brothers and sisters. We're living in a day and an age where we are being ruled by fools. We're living in a time where wisdom is something that is in very short supply. It is a, a, a commodity that simply oftentimes does not exist. This is what we're dealing with. And I'm going to tell you, there is a difference. And we're probably living in an age where there's more knowledge and more learning than there has ever been before. But learning and knowledge is not wisdom. You see, there's a difference here. And the proverb writer makes it very clear. There's a difference in education. You can have a great education, but no wisdom. And, and you know, I've I got to tell you something. I have known of PhDs uh, in, 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 in my lifetime. And I've known several. But I've got to tell you, many of these guys that have PhDs that I have known and encountered in my lifetime does not have the wisdom that my granddad did that had an 8th grade education. And that's just, that just shows you. There's a difference in wisdom and knowledge. We can have knowledge but no wisdom. Now let's talk about the wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs always begins with your knowledge of and your respect for God. You see, there's two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom that dispenses from God and there's the wisdom that dispenses from the world, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 22, which is also demonic wisdom, James 3 and verse 15. But wisdom that we need to focus upon and that we need to have always begins with God. I want, to, I want you to notice now, going back to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom. Now, let's look at it this way. Let, let, let's just think about it in, in, in this regard. Remember, there's the wisdom of the world, 1 Corinthians 1, and then there's the wisdom of God. The knowledge of, the fear of God. So there's two dispensing of wisdom. Now, the, not, the wisdom of the world has always built its ivory tower in order to supplant the wisdom of God. Now let, 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 me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Building these ivory towers, these lofty towers. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 11. The wisdom of God told the people, you disperse, you go throughout the world. You populate the world. Now the wisdom of men at that time said, no. We're going to supplant the wisdom of God. And we're going to all stay right here together. And so what they did is they built this lofty tower that would, would, would rise up as a landmark and the people would not scatter any further than they could see that tower. But now what, God, what did God do? God came down and confounded the language of these people and broke up their communication so therefore they had to disperse. God always does this. God always comes down and confuses the wisdom of the wise. And I'm talking about the worldly wise. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14, wisdom of the wise men shall perish. Do you know that? Yeah, now I want you to think about something. There, there was a guy back in 1967, Paul Ulrich, and he was a Nobel Prize winning German physician and scientist. And he made a decree from his lofty tower from his tower of education, from the wisdom of the world, 
And Ulrich said in 1967 that the U.S. was so overpopulated and needed to force sterilization or we would face a famine in 1975. That was touted in the New York Times. That was touted in the Washington Post and all across the country. People were, people were scared to death that we were going to face a famine in 1975 that would destroy the U.S. population. Well, 1975 has come and gone many decades ago. And all of that proclamation from the powers that be and from the intellectual community, from the wisdom of the world, has gone by the wayside, thrown on the ash heap of history. God has a way of doing this. And we need, to be a, we, we need to be cognizant of what God is doing and recognizing that these intellectual betters that we're bowing down to do not have the wisdom of God. The Boston Globe, another newspaper of note, April 16, 1970, predicted a coming ice age by the 21st century. People were scared to death because of the ozone layer and all of these other things that we kept hearing so much about. Acid rain and all of these things were just panicking. This is the wisdom that the world is giving to us. And God always confounds the wisdom of the world. And I'll tell you something else we could talk about here. We could talk about this foolish idea of gender identity, transgenderism, and, 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 and you know, health wine. Healthline come out and said this, yes, it's possible for men to become pregnant and give birth to children of their own. A fact, in fact, it's probably a lot more common than you might think. This is the wisdom of the world. And this is directly opposed to what the wisdom of God says. That God in the beginning made them male and female. And when you think about even one of our Supreme Court justices who could not define what a woman is because, quote, I'm not a biologist. This is the wisdom of the world. And we cannot bow down to the wisdom of the world because God's wisdom, wisdom that we need to live by, originates with God. And wisdom, I've got to tell you something. Wisdom is not something that you do. You know, sometimes we look at somebody, well, that, that's, that's wise, and, and so forth. But some, wisdom is not something that you do. Wisdom is the way that we do something. We do it wisely. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Wisdom is the way that we live our lives consistent with the will of God. And, and I'm going to tell you, wisdom, wisdom is not ever able to be identified except in terms of our relationship to God. If we're not having a relationship with God, it doesn't matter what we're doing, we're not doing it wisely. Amen. It's, it begins with and it ends with our relationship to God. Listen to what he says. The, again, the proverb writer says in chapter 9 and in verse 10, the fear of the Lord, he says this over and over throughout Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. <laughs> You look at what James says about this in James, which I consider to be, the book of James, a New Testament version of Proverbs. James talks about this wisdom from above that we live by. It's called the meekness of wisdom. And I won't tell you people, wisdom is not dispensed on TikTok. Wisdom is not dispensed on Instagram, Facebook, in schools or universities. You may get information from those places and you may get education from the schools of higher learning, but you're not getting wisdom that comes from a relationship to God. It begins and it ends with God. Verse 
5 of chapter 2. Then, he's talking about wisdom here, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Wisdom. Wisdom begins with God. Secondly, wisdom is attained only by the person who seeks that wisdom. You don't receive it by osmosis. You don't receive it by sitting in a church building. You don't receive it uh, by just being in close proximity to those who may have wisdom. It's something that must be sought. Chapter 15 and verse 14 of the book of Proverbs says, The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. But the mouth of fools... He said it feeds on foolishness. And man, I tell you, that again is information that our, our culture and our society and this generation desperately needs. Chapter 8 and verse 17. And chapter 8 is interesting in the book of Proverbs because what it does here, it takes the subject of wisdom and personifies it. You know what I mean by that? It, it, it takes wisdom and treats it like a person. You know? Wisdom is, is, is thought of as a person. It's personified. So when you read through the 8th chap, chapter of the book of Proverbs and you say, seek me, seek, I was there when God created. It's not talking about a literal person. It's talking about wisdom. Wisdom is personified in chapter 8. And here's what it says in verse 17. I, again, wisdom is talking here. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. So what we see here is wisdom can be sought and wisdom can be found. You know, the Bible tells us in the New Testament we're to, we're to pray for wisdom. Uh, and, and, and God will give us liberally. And, and so we've got to be seeking this wisdom. Proverbs 1 and verse 5. A wise man will hear and increase learning. Do you ever notice the New Testament kind of em em emphasizes that as well? Again, again, a wise man will hear and increase learning. Jesus said, the more that you have, the more you will receive. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 12. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 7, ask. And it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. And that is certainly true of wisdom. But you know what? Here's the deal. Not everybody wants wisdom. I, I, I just got to tell you that not everyone desires to have wisdom. And I know that sounds astounding. I know we, yeah, JR, surely everybody. No. People don't. As, as a matter of fact, Proverbs 17 and verse 16 says, Why is there in the hand of a fool the purchase price of wisdom? Since he has no heart for it. It's there, it's available, he has the purchase price, but he doesn't want it. It's something that he does not seek. You know, we... we, we I've, you know, you heard here all your life. You've heard, you know, our little take on this. Uh, you know, you buy them books and send them to school. What do they do? Burn down the gym. Well, they didn't seek learning. You know, we we get that. That's what the proverb writer is telling us here. And I think it was Albert Einstein who is credited with saying insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Now, that's not clinical insanity. That's clinically lacking wisdom is what that is. It, it, it's, 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 it's living like a fool or living with folly. No wisdom. Now think about it this way. You look at a couple, a married couple, and they're having problem after problem after problem and the marriage is going south in a New York minute. And you know what happens? 
People will let counsel them, people will talk to them, people will approach the Bible, or take the Bible and approach them with the Bible. And you know what they do? They do the same thing over and over again. There's hatred and bitterness and meanness in that family. And they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, rejecting everything that God says. Do they want wisdom? No. They don't. They do the same thing over and over again, hoping that it gets better. It won't get better. You've got the price of wisdom in your hand, but you're not purchasing it. You see what I'm saying? Young people are that way. I see, I see young Christian men and women as well that you know begin to look for a mate. They want to get married. And they want to have a relationship. And they're looking for this relationship in all the wrong places and they get this bomb. And then they'll exchange it for another bomb and exchange it for another bomb. I don't understand. Why am I just attracted? Where are you looking? What are you looking for? You need to have wisdom in these things. Wisdom means that you evaluate the situation, that you make choices based upon the teaching of God's Word. When we don't improve our lives, when we don't you know, get rid of these bad habits and all these other things, it shows to us that we truly do not wish to have wisdom. Proverbs 7 and verse 7. I saw among the simple. Now here he's giving us a... He's telling us about a young man here that... He said he's a, he's a simple. I, I know that, that that's offensive to a lot of people. I, I, he said, I, I saw among the simple. I perceived among the youth a man devoid of understanding. So what this young man does, he goes in the way of where a harlot is and she entices him and he falls for her ploys and he commits sin with her. And, and, and the prophet writer said, the reason this happened is he opened himself up to this. He put himself in a place where he was destined to fail and destined to fall. He's devoid of wisdom. Now you stay in that same chapter and you look in verse 21 with her enticing speech she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips she seduced him. Immediately he went in after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Now well, what happened? What? He was foolish. He, he opened himself up to what happened. And he destroyed himself by the choices that he was making. He was acting without wisdom. You know, I, I, I gotta tell you. Whenever you hear, whenever you hear somebody say something to this effect, well, that won't happen to me. Or someone says that that can't happen to me. What you have here is a simpleton. What you have here is someone who is living in folly and foolishness because it can happen to you. And I think about that when I read about all of these pornographic websites that young men can access and fill their mind with the filth of this world and think that's not going to affect me it's already affected you it has already hooked you into a life of folly and foolishness it can happen and it is happening and all of the flirtations and all of these other things that we think are just innocent no they're not we are living a foolish and a folly life it can happen and I could give you documentation of people I have known that's been snatched and snared just simply because they were devoid of understanding. Living a life of foolishness. Proverbs also tells us that wisdom will be dispensed to those who seek the counsel of the wise. 
Now there are wise people among us. There are wise people that we can look to that have built their lives according to the teaching of God's Word. There's no question about that. And we can look to these wise people. I want you to notice something. In, in Proverbs chapter 1, and, and, and we'll begin at verse, at, at, at verse well, at verse 1, uh, or Proverbs chapter 7 rather. I said Proverbs chapter, chapter 5, but I meant chapter 7, going back to the young man devoid of understanding. In Proverbs 7 and verse 1, here's what, here's what he, the, the writer Solomon is saying to his son. He said, my son, keep my words. Now what he's doing is dispensing wisdom to his son. And, and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them as tablets on your heart. Say to, the, say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your nearest kin. That they may keep you from the immoral woman from the seductress who flatters with her words. So listen to what I'm telling you. How, how many fathers have said that to their children, to their sons, to their daughters? Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. And, 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 and what happens? What happens is these young people that just push these older people, like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand. You simply do not recognize what's going on in this world. You're too old-fashioned. You're too archaic. You know what they're doing? They said, I don't want to listen to the wisdom of the wise. I don't want to go where this previous generation has gone. But he says, if you'll do this, you will avoid what happens to this foolish young man that we just read about a moment ago. I, I, I have found, not just in my own family, but in lots of families, it, it's so enticing it seems for some young people to just reject the wisdom of the parents and wisdom of the older generation. I, I, I don't... I, I simply at my age, it's hard for me to understand that. You sit with young people, they... I, I just wish my parents were not so stupid. I, I wish my parents were not so backward, not so dumb. And, and I wish they would just lighten up and and they're just trying to deprive me of having a good time. And, and if, I wish they'd just leave me alone. They're just, just, just trying to control my life. Young people, let me tell you. Your, your parents are not your enemies. They're not trying to destroy your life. What they're trying to do is to provide you with enough wisdom so that you can have a life. That you will not make the mistakes that so many in the world are making. Remember what the New Testament says? New Testament says that if you obey your parents, you know, honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. There's, there's a reason for that. They're trying to tell you some things that you can avoid that will provide you with the opportunity to have a long and prosperous life. And Proverbs says the same thing as Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. i got to tell you something. It's not. It's not just a younger generation throwing off the wisdom of parents and grandparents. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around at the church situation in the Indianapolis area and know we are in dire trouble. Churches are going in directions that people in my generation never thought they would live to see churches going into those directions. But I'm going to tell you what one of the reasons for those directional changes. It's because they have young men preaching the gospel who want to throw off the wisdom of the older generation and say we can do it better. They made mistakes. 
they emphasized authority and they talked about authority for this and authority for that. We need to get away from that. And they're throwing off the wisdom that the older generation had. Men such as Billy Moore and Roy Cogdell and these men who fought the fight, fought the good fight of faith and held churches from going into apostasy and now that's being thrown off. No respect for the teaching of God's Word with the newer generation. It's, it's pitiful. But this is something that the wise man has warned us about over and over and over again. We need to listen to the wisdom of the previous generation if that wisdom was anchored in the teaching of God's Word. And then finally, let's have enough common sense to understand what I refer to as street wisdom. Street wisdom is all around you. You say, well, J.R., what, 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 what do you mean by that? Well, let's go to Proverbs 1 and verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud outside. Now think about that. Uh, wisdom calls aloud. You can go outside. And you can encounter wisdom each and every day. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. You see it everywhere. Yeah, you do. You read the internet, you read the paper, you read about murders, you read about this going on and that going on. You, you see, you, wisdom is out there if we were just listening. She cries out in the chief concourses. There's shootings everywhere. And the openings in the gates of the city. Looting, crime, and all of these things that are occurring throughout, the, throughout our society. She speaks her words, how long you simple ones Will you love simplicity for scorners delight in their scorning? And then the same in chapter 8. Chapter 8, the, Hebrew, the proverb writer warns again and again and again. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city at the entrance of the doors. All we've got to look at is society and we see the devastation, the destruction and death that's all around us. And we're fools if we ignore it. We see drugs and the problem that it's causing. The death by fentanyl. Hundreds of thousands of people. That's the leading cause of death for young people between the ages of 18 and 45. Wisdom in the streets is telling us what happens when there is a life given to promiscuity and to drugs and to alcohol. It's in the street. It's all around us. Are we looking? Are we seeing the wisdom that is out there? Or do we just live in foolish folly? We know what's happening. All we have to do is look at juvenile court. Look at the arrest. Look at the death by drugs and, and, and reckless driving and the use of smokeless about all of this is wisdom. Street wisdom. Are we wise enough to listen and build our lives according to the wisdom that emanates from God? And if we do, we will avoid these things that we've talked about. I, I want you to understand something. My sermon today in the book of Proverbs doesn't tell you how to be saved. What it tells you is that how you can live 